Sunday School Leader. Hey, before we get into this week's lesson, I just wanted to tell you that I've put out on Facebook these Prep Talk videos. So if you're a Facebook user and it might be easier for you to view these via Facebook instead of going out to YouTube and looking for them, uh, if you want to, you can just search for Prep Talk, all one word, and it should come up. It's a community group, and if you like that or follow that page, uh, then when I post these videos weekly, it will update it and you'll get a Facebook notification on that. So just another way to get the word out, I guess. All right, let's see where we are this week. Remember, we're in the unit entitled Broken Vessels, How God Uses Imperfect People. We're in week three. The title of the lesson is The Gift of Grace. And we're looking in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. And the point of the lesson is that God's grace allows me to face anything that life throws at me. Like I said, we're in 2 Corinthians. If you want to tell a little political joke, you might say that we're in 2 Corinthians this week. Now, as I read through the lesson text, uh, without even looking at uh, the Sunday school material or anything, just reading the text, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, what does this have to do with imperfect people and and all that. So anyway, you have to read the whole thing, and it, it kind of comes together uh, toward the end. So if we're looking at grace this week, we need to define what grace actually is. So you might ask that question, what is grace? Of course, you're going to have somebody probably say, well, it's something you say before you eat, eat a meal. Uh, somebody else may remember that acronym that's several decades old, that's God's Riches at Christ's Expense. Uh, and so you get away from those, what's a real definition of that? And somebody might confuse it and, and say that it's mercy. And those two are, are close, but uh, it, it, they oftentimes get confused. So we need to differentiate between mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting the bad that you deserve. Uh, those who are convicted of a crime, they fall on the mercy of the court, right? They don't want the full extent of the law. In the, in the religious sense, in the Christian sense, mercy is that we, as believers, will not experience hell. We will not get the bad that we deserve. Grace is kind of the flip side of that coin. It's getting the good that you don't deserve. Uh, the opposite of karma. You know, karma is uh, what goes around comes around. Uh, you act bad in this life, in the next life it comes around and, and bites you and you know, all that. So it, and, and it's not that. It is that believers will experience heaven, that we get the good that we don't deserve. So that's basically what grace is. Well, just as a rough outline for this week, I'm going to use this. I'm going to divide it into three different sections and say that in the Christian life, number one, we're going to experience mountaintops. <clears throat> we're going to experience those good times. Number two is that we're going to experience hardships. We're going to experience what we consider to be those really bad, those rough times. And then three, that God's grace during the, all those times, but especially is made more evident during those rough times, during those hardships, God's grace is, is sufficient during those times. So let's first look at the mountaintops. We look at, at Paul and, and in this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the mountaintop he experienced was being called up to that third heaven. Now, it's like, well, how many heavens are there? Well, in Jewish thought, there were three different levels of heaven. There were the heavens where the, what we would call the atmosphere, where the birds fly, rain, falls, all that, the clouds. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is where the stars are, uh, the outer space region. And then the third heaven would be what we consider, what we picture in our minds as heaven, where God resides. Now, Paul starts off and he says, I know a man who experienced this, who was caught up, caught up to the third level of heaven. Now, is Paul talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? Most think that Paul's talking about himself. As we look at verses 1, in fact, let's go back and, and read that. It's not in our lesson text, but he says, um, chapter 12, verse 1, I must uh, go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. So he's going to be talking about some of the visions and revelations that he's had. And then he goes into this third person of, I knew a man who experienced this. So why did he do that? Uh, why did he talk in the third person here? Well, maybe it was perhaps to not come across as being too boastful about himself. You know, John did this. 
you know, the, there was the apostle that, or the disciple that Jesus loved, and he was referring to himself. So that was a, a, a common, uh, a common practice of, of writing about yourself like that. So it wasn't unknown to do that. But also perhaps this experience that Paul had may have been a little surreal in the in the fact that it was. Uh, in fact, he says, was I in the body or was I out of the body? Was this a physical, my body was in heaven, or was this just uh, a vision in, in my mind? He didn't really know. It was so out of body and surreal. He described it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an onlooker. So he experienced this glimpse of heaven. In verse 4, he describes it as indescribable. So you've got the good times, right? Then you've got the, the hardships. Paul says he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan. And why was he given that? Well, he tells us it was he was given that so he would not exalt himself. This was a messenger of Satan that God allowed. And I liken this to Job. It was Satan who did these things, but yet it was allowed by God. Now, when we think of a thorn, first thing I think of is a rose bush. You know, the rose bush has a little thorns on it. It's real sticky, prickly, and kind of hurts when, it, when you touch it. This Greek word for thorn is, literally is a dangerously sharp, um, spiked uh, spike or an instrument or a tool. It's used uh, for pain. In fact, it was used to describe a stake that an, enemy, an enemy's head was placed on when they were decapitated. Uh, pretty ugly to think about, isn't it? When Paul says that he was given this thorn or this spike in the flesh. It, it like in, in my mind, I go back to Acts 26, 14, where Paul is talking about his vision on the road to Damascus. And Jesus says to him, why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you kicking against these sharp, pointy uh, sticks? They, they hurt. Quit doing that. All right. So, so what was this thorn? Lots of debate on this. You're going to hear all kinds of illnesses. And it was at his eyesight and, uh, those are possibilities, but if we look down in verse 10, he lists several things. In fact, uh, let me read that. We get down to verse 10 of chapter 12. He says, That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He didn't list any physical ailments there, unless you want to consider weaknesses. But he, I think he's using this weakness as uh, what he's talking about. In, in all the hardships that's that's come his way. Now, so in, in my mind, his thorn in the flesh is the resistance to the gospel that he's been getting. This is the messenger of Satan. Satan does not want the gospel propagated, doesn't want it advanced. And so he's doing everything he can to stop that. And even though Paul was quite successful, he was met with lots and lots of resistance. In fact, let's, if we look back in the previous chapter, in chapter 11, verses 23 through 33, Paul lists all the different kinds of persecutions and, and beatings and things that he went through. He had the 39 lashes. He said he was beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked. He uh, encountered false teachers. He was imprisoned. He was hungry. He was thirsty. All these things that were evidence that he was running against resistance to the gospel. So I believe that chapter 12 that we're in this week builds on the persecutions that were listed there in chapter 11. Regardless, if you want to think it's eyesight or persecution or uh, malaria, whatever, it, it really doesn't matter what the thorn in the flesh was, he experienced it. Let's bring this over to our lives. Do we experience hardships? I'm going to say as a minister, some of these hardships don't come from non-believers. They can come from folks in the pew. Now, that's not true just for ministers. That's true for other pew setters as well, isn't it? But sometimes our worst enemies can be our fellow believers and the way that we treat each other, and that just should not be. Much of a minister and other Christians' frustration can come from people, uh, the people of God, who don't act godly. You know, there are camps, retreats, there's programs specifically for ministers who have been abused by their congregations. Should not be. But, you know, we all, all of us experience hardships from illnesses to resistance to disobedient children, abusive pastors, abusive congregations, 
while believers in the other other parts of the world are experiencing more physical violence and even some life-threatening uh, threats and uh, actions against them. But through it all, through the good times, through the, through the mountaintops, through the hardships, God's grace is sufficient. Let's note that the grace of the I am, not the I was or the I will be, the grace of the I am is sufficient. It, it doesn't say it will be sufficient or it was sufficient. It's all present tense. The I am, the grace of the I am is sufficient. All right, that's great. How does all this tie into the overall theme of broken vessels, how God uses imperfect people? Well, the hardships in our life that come our way often make us broken. The resistance that people give us, the, the illnesses that we have, sometimes they just, they just break us down. And um, whether that's, like I said, resistance or ridicule or illness or whatever, we need to remember God's grace is sufficient in those times and God's power is made more evident in our lives through our weakness. God's power in us allows us to persevere when others might give up. Now naturally, I know I do, I want the life of ease. I don't want a life of hardships, uh, both at home, both at church, but that's not the reality, is it? Let's look at the life of Jesus. Did he have a life of ease? This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. He was ridiculed, beaten, crucified. We look at the life of Paul. The same thing, all right? Why should we expect a life that's easier and better than, than these two? So when hardships, when persecutions come, we need to reflect on this. We need to remember this. We need to allow the strength of Christ to push us forward, to not give up. Sure, we're going to pray for relief. That's okay. Paul did that, didn't he? But here's the thing, that relief may or may not come. Paul prayed for it three times. And he was told that, his, that God's grace is sufficient for him during those times. So let's allow the pain in our life, and let's try to communicate to our Sunday school students that the pain in our life should draw us closer to, not drive us away from God. Man, that's easy to say in Sunday school class, isn't it? It's easy to say when things are going well, we're just sitting around all looking pretty on Sunday morning. I mean, that's another thing when those terrible events happen in our lives, when we get the phone call in the middle of the night, or the tornado devastates the church or the home or you know, whatever. Just list, just list those things. Uh, they're, they're countless that can happen to us. Remember, though, pray for your class this week that whatever your students are going through now or in the future, that God is going to be glorified that his strength will be made evident in the weakness of both us as a teacher and the students as well in, the, in, our, in our lives. Well, thanks very much for watching this week. I hope you have a great, great Sunday School lesson. Yeah.